Um, today's sermon is entitled, oh, going reverse, it's going the opposite direction. The year of the pearl. The year of the pearl. I'm hoping that, by the grace of God, that this year when someone says to you, oh, what are your intentions for the year? What have you got planned for this year? What's happening in your life this year? What are the major events of your life this year? I'm hoping that there will be a call in your mind to remember the sermon. It's called the year of the pearl. The year of the pearl. So what type of year are you going to have? Hopefully, hopefully by the end of the sermon, you'll recognize and realize it's really about the pearl. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you today for the Sabbath, the beautiful words of those amazing songs. I want to thank you for the prayer of Dr. Nick. I just pray that this message would be personal. Lord, you know every one of us. You knit us together in a mother's womb. You say that we're two or more of us are gathered in your name. You are, Lord, there among them, even in the midst of them. We believe that through faith. And Lord, without you today, nothing would make sense. So we thank you that you are here and that everything can make sense when we give you our life. Just pray for your Holy Spirit's anointing upon me today, God. It's empty me of my sin and self. No, I'm a wretched man, Lord, but you're a great God. And it's surely not about me, it's about you. So speak now, I pray in Jesus' your name. The year of the pearl. I want to ask you this question. Have you found the purpose of life? Now, some of you might be sitting there comfortably thinking, yeah, yeah, I know what life's all about. You know, I've given my heart to Jesus and that gave me some purpose. Some of you might be sitting in church today and going, actually, I don't know the purpose of my life yet. It was a long time of my life, I didn't know the purpose of it. I had no idea what the purpose of my life was about. I was traveling here and there, always looking for something to fulfill me and complete me, but I couldn't find it. It wasn't until I found Jesus that I found the purpose of my life. So if you are in that predicament this morning, if you're looking to find out the purpose of your life, I want to tell you it can be found in Jesus. I don't know why it does reverse. It's weird. Obviously, I'm going the wrong way. That would be the logical. Can you go to the next slide? All right. So... The next question though, that you might ask yourself is, once you've found the purpose, once you've surrendered your heart to Jesus, is what now is God's will for my life? What is God's will for my life? Because I think a lot of us ask that, don't we? I've accepted Jesus as my Savior, but what do I now do that I've accepted Jesus as my Savior? Have you ever asked yourself that question before? Let's be honest, anyone here before asked that question? Someone's either got paralysis in here this morning, or oh, we're liars. Has anyone ever asked that question? What's God's will for my life? You've asked that question for? All right, amen. So we're on, the, we're on the same page. We're on the same page. Well, I believe the Bible is emphatically clear. The Bible says in the book of Micah, chapter 6, verse 8, the following. He has shown you, O man, it's generalization of all people, what is good? What does the Lord require of you? Actually answers the question the prophet is thinking. Through inspiration, it says... To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. I love how clear the Bible is. You see, we live in a philosophical age where people think they can take parts of the Bible and they can say this remains to be true and this isn't true. I tell you what, from Genesis through to Revelation, everything this Bible says is the truth. Amen. Amen. You can't decipher it and take bits you want because it's easy and comfortable. No, you have to read it in its entirety. All scripture is given by inspiration. Amen? So the Bible tells us clearly, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. So what's that all about? If you think about it this morning, justice is realizing people make mistakes. Realizing people make mistakes. You know, I make mistakes. So obviously other people are going to make mistakes, aren't they? Okay? Treating people how you would want to be treated after you've made a mistake. Not giving people what they deserve, but rather what they desperately need. It's called restorative justice. Not what they necessarily deserve. And maybe some people need to go behind bars for a season. But it's what they desperately need. Justice. Why? Because John chapter 3 verse 17 says what? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Might be saved. You see, that's the justice of God. Not giving us what we deserve, 
For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. By giving us justice, his justice, a restorative justice, he came to seek and to save that which was lost, which is me and which is you this morning. To restore us, to make us whole, to make us complete, to make us beautiful again. Amen? That's true justice. And that's the type of justice God wants us to have for others. To see the best in them, even when they don't look so beautiful in an outward appearance. To look beyond the exterior and to seek deep for the interior, the heart. Because God can change people's hearts, amen? He's changed mine and continues to change mine. Don't forget where you've come from once you've been converted. It's easy to do that sometimes. Remember how it was in those days. And don't be critical of others. Show them justice. Why? Because God shows us justice. Justice. What about mercy? What is mercy? Well, mercy is compassion. It's grace. It's forgiveness. It's not enforcing the power you could have. And in my favorite chapter in the Bible, Luke chapter 15, from 11 through to 32, you would know the story of the prodigal. It's not condemning. The father had every right to say to his son, what have you done? Why have you wasted the inheritance I gave you? Why have you squandered your life? He had every right to say those things, but he didn't. Why? Because he loved his son. And God loves us, and we are his sons, and we are his daughters. We are his children, amen. God doesn't use condemnation. He comes to Adam and Eve in the garden and says, what have you done? Doesn't say, oh, no, look what you've done. Who told you to eat of the knowledge of good and evil? He doesn't come with condemnation. He comes with goodness. And he embraces. And he helps and he holds and he builds up and he restores. He fixes. That's the type of mercy God shows us. And that's the type of mercy that this world needs to desperately see. Are you with me this morning? And what about the next one? Humility. Humility is about benefiting others. Putting them first. Not being critical. Surrendering yourself for the benefit of others. And I think the Bible gives the most pertinent and beautiful demonstration when it says the following in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. Let this mind be in you. In who? In In you, us, which was also in Christ Jesus. He doesn't ask us to do something he hasn't done, by the way. Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. No. He made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. In verse 8, here it is. And being found in appearance as a man, He humbled himself. He humbled himself. He humbled himself. Never forget that. And became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Because he deserved it? No. Why? Because he loves us. Because he loves us. That's why. He shows us true humility. True humility is able to sacrifice yourself for others, for others, without going against your conscience, amen? Humility. Summary, justice is to care for the vulnerable and to have a genuine respect for people. Mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. Think about that. To walk humbly with God is to know him intimately as your friend. And to be attentive to what he desires and loves. And what does he love? He loves people. (laughs) He loves people, amen? He loves people. He loves people. So how do we become like this? How do we become like this? Now We've been going through, just finished a series of James. And I think if you read this next little statement here, courtesy of Thank you, Blair. Conversation we had in my garage this week. If you want to find out what your real priorities are, examine where you spend your time, money, 
and your energies. This is the true reflection of where your heart really is with God. Oh, that's quite a heavy statement, eh? We have to analyze ourselves. You might say you're a Christian. Congratulations. But are you a Christian? There's a big difference. There is a big difference, amen? A lot of people know all about God. and They can recite lots of facts and even quote scripture. doesn't mean they know God. Nicodemus knew plenty of stuff, amen? But God said to him, what? You, you, singular, you must be born again. Oh. Think about that. Think about that this morning. James 1, 27 says this. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. To keep himself what? Come on, we can do better than that. To keep himself unspotted. We're a little bit reluctant to say that, weren't we? Why do you think God asks us to be unspotted from the world? I'll tell you why I think. Because if you're so consumed and you're so caught up in me, 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 I've got to go there, I've got to do this, I've got to see that, I want to do that with my family, oh, da, 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 da. you're not concerned about anyone else's needs but your own, amen? And you don't see the needs of others because you're too busy doing what you want to do. Spending the money on what you want to spend it on. God says, hey, 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 slow down a little bit. Slow down a little bit. Don't waste your life just trying to chase emptiness. Find something worth living for. Live for others, Amy. Because that's how he lives. For others. And there is no greater joy than living for others, Amy. There's no greater joy. This morning I was driving to church thinking about my sermon. And I noticed at the corner of my eye, there was a car on the side of the road down the Condong exit. And I saw a woman sitting in the driver's seat. She looked a little bit uncomfortable. Just, you know, a quick glance. Felt impressed. Go back. Go back, Carl. I thought, man, going to church. Going to church, Lord. Go back, Carl. Okay. Drove a little bit further. Felt the strong. Go back. Got up to the next Exit, turn left, and then went back around and pulled up. And yeah, you guessed it, they had a flat tire. The tire was completely shredded. And the woman and her husband were there together, and the man was actually had just had a heart surgery. And uh, he couldn't fix the tire by himself. I said, oh, you know, what's going on? They said, oh, you know, we've rung the um, roadside assistance. I'll be about now. I said, it's all right, don't worry, I'll fix it, it's all good. I said, yeah, I'll take care of it. It's not a problem. I'm, I'm early. I'll, I'll sort it out for you. Anyway, started to fix the tire. Like, well, are you going to work? I said, no, I'm going to church. <laughs> took my, took my, well, I didn't have a jacket. I didn't have my shirt. I took my shirt off. I had to show And um, yeah, I wasn't bare chest. It's all good. <laughs> and um, took, took my shirt off and um, started to fix it. And then, you know, started to share little things. And I was just open to the Spirit's leading. And I was dropping in, dropping in things. And he said, you know, he said it's heart surgery and started talking about, you know, he said something about tires or something. I said, oh, you know, it's such a blessing to have a car, though. I once walked the, walked the length of New Zealand to raise awareness for suicide statistics. And they said, oh, yeah, well, uh, they said, why did you do that? I said, because so many people suffer with depression. And the, and the man said, you know what, I'm suffering with depression right now. I said, is that so? Anyway, I started to share with him a little bit and then um, finished doing the job I was doing. And I looked at him, and I just felt impressed. You need to pray with these people. And I looked at his forearm, and I noticed on his forearm he had this tattoo, and it said Black Sabbath. I used to listen to them. <laughs> so I said to him, I was like, hey, I used to listen to them. Isn't it ironic that now I actually go to church on the Sabbath? I dropped that little seed in there too. <laughs> and then I said, you know what, guys? I really want to pray for you. And they were just completely open to that. They bowed their heads, you know, he's tattooed up and all the rest of it. You know, I, I, I really believe he probably hasn't got a lot longer to live that man. Who knows? And I prayed with them. See, God orchestrated that event to transpire this morning. It's not a coincidence, amen? And I'll tell you what, that made me confident coming to church this morning. Because I knew I was coming to give you a message, amen? And I prayed with them and uh, said, hopefully I'll see you in the kingdom. Maybe I will one day. Maybe I will.
I want to share another story. Not to bring glory to myself, but I want to just help you to understand something. You see, God is in this business of fixing up people's lives. Who knows what's going to happen from this day forth in their life? I don't know, but maybe one day I'll find out about it. Many years ago, when I went back to New Zealand to study, I was in church one Sabbath, and there was a lady there called Beverly. Everyone that I know, Beverly, that's called Beverly, is beautiful, by the way. So if you're named Beverly, it's a beautiful name. (laughs) And you're probably a beautiful person. Anyway, Beverly was there, an old lady. She's a nana. She used to go there by herself. Well, one day she came to church and she was with somebody. She was with this young guy. You know, I looked at him, he's like a teenager, late teens, maybe 16, 17, I thought. He looked a little bit disheveled. I thought, man, what's up with that guy? But, you know, I'm a pretty curious person. So I knew that I was going to be speaking to her and finding out what's going on here because I'd never seen her with Beverly before. I didn't really know a lot about Beverly. Anyway, I got talking. There was a Sabbath luncheon on, and I went and sat down next to them, and I said, hey, buddy, what's your name? <laughs> It's like, what? <laughs> Ashley, Ashley, Ashley. Hey, man. Oh, how come you're here? Who, who's this? Oh, this is my nana. She's brought me to church today. Well, I was you 17. I said, well, why are you here? And he said, I want to change my life. I want to turn my life around. I know that this is the place that I need to be. I said, really? Well, how do you know that? Well, him and I became close friends. Happened to be that he was living just around the corner from me, and I thought, I'm going to take him under my wing, and I'm going to mentor this young fella. Turns out that Ashley had been living a very wicked life, doing all kinds of evil acts. One day, Ashley and his friends decided to break into a home and steal some things. They thought that was pretty funny. They went back to the party that they'd been attending later on, and his friend started to get into an altercation with another male, and that male produced a knife, a big knife. Ashley seen this from afar, and he decided to intervene. He ran and dived at the assailant to, attack him, to tackle him to the ground and knock that weapon out of his hand. Somehow, in all the wrestling, Ashley ended up underneath that man, and that man took that knife and started to stab it into his body. Not one. Not twice. Not 10 times, 13 times. But this is the important bit. What happened, Ashley tells me, all of a sudden this great power came upon him. It picked him up and it dragged him, not directly across the street, but a few houses down. He knocked on the door of the house, fell down in a pool of blood, and a paramedic, would you believe it, who had just returned home from work and taken a shower some five minutes before, came and attended to the situation, started to put pressure on his wounds, and saved his life, amen? He was in church, and he decided to give his life to God because he could see how God had intervened in his life, and he was clever enough to realize that and to recognize that and to actually do something about it, amen? Ashley went on, to go back to school to get his diploma or certificate. He went on to go to Mission College, Louis Teresa's school. And he even, would you believe it, he even got married. Can you say amen? Second child's on the way. Now there he is. That's him and his wife. Now I don't know if you know, but kind of hard to, or maybe it's right for you guys to see, but on his left shoulder is somebody standing next to him. That's his best man. That's his best man. What right do I have to help him in his journey? God gave me a blessing to help him to change his life, amen. To support him. Because he was one of those people who had a father, but he was really fatherless. His father had done nothing for him. And we became great friends. And he is a solid man of God. And I tell you that, This morning, because it would have been easy to look at him and judge him. But you can't judge people, amen? The old saying is still true today, don't judge a book by its cover. You've never walked in somebody else's shoes. You've never been in their house or seen the arguments that have taken place or what they might have had to deal with as a young... You don't know. God knows. God knows. So don't go around judging people, just start loving people, I mean. I tell you that story to encourage you. If you've got a family member who's out there running with the world, don't stop praying, I mean. 
You know what the change was in his life? Beverly, Nana Beth, was praying. That old saint praying and praying and praying and believing and praying and, and, and it came. And it came. And it came. Don't stop praying. I want to read another story about a saint in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts. And it goes like this. You might know the story. I think there's a lot of beautiful points that we can draw from it this morning. So is this. Acts chapter 9, verses 36 to 41, if you want to follow along with me, say the following. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in the upper room. And since Lydia was near Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter rose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the windows, sorry, and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas or Tabitha had made while she was with them when she was alive. But Peter put them out, knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. I want you to think just briefly about the story. See, this woman was full of good works. What was she full of? Good works. She was taking care of people's needs. She could see something that needs or needed to be addressed so she inserted herself into the situation and provided and cared and loved and watered and spent time and listened and comforted. That was the type of person that she was. You see, we don't need $10 million to make a difference in this world. We don't even need $1. All we need is Jesus. Do you realize that? People think, oh, oh, I'm too old, or I'm too young, or I don't have the rubbish. You have everything that you need in Jesus. And every one of us has an ability to do something. It might be that you can bake beautiful cakes, like my wife. It might be that you can take loaves of bread to people who need that once a week. It might be that you can invite someone over just to have a cold drink of water. It might be next time you eat in a cafe, just cleaning up after yourself and giving the person a smile and say, hey, you're doing a great job today. It might be that. You see, we get confused and, and, and distorted in our thinking that we need to be some grand, amazing person with fantastic oracles, oratorical skills that can change the world. That's not it. The gospel is about relationship, connection, one-on-one. -on -one. People are usually one as individuals as individual. So this woman sees a need and she starts serving that need, amen. What need are we serving in this community? You see, acting justly and mercifully, mercifully, it presents itself in this way. The term for mercy is the Hebrew word chizheth, God's unconditional grace and compassion, that's what it means. The word for justice is the Hebrew term mishpath. Its most basic meaning is to treat people equitably, it occurs 200 times in the Hebrew, Hebrew Old Testament. Don't tell me that God didn't show grace in the Old Testament, amen. Lord, have mercy. And of course, you know the verse in Matthew 7, 12, about treating people how you want to be treated. Mishpat puts the emphasis on the action. Chizheth puts it on attitude or motive behind the action. To walk with God, then, we must do justice out of merciful love. It's love that changes people. It really is. It's what changed me when someone started to love me. What is showing justice and mercy really about? Justice reflects the character, the what? The character of God. Why I'm emphasizing this? Well, we are involved. This is where I was going with this. We're involved in serving a community, the Kingscliff community, the Tweed community, the Gold Coast community. For our community to see Christ, that's what we're here for, isn't it? That's what we're trying to achieve, that people would actually see Jesus. We must truly reflect the character of God. And what is God's character? It's simple. 1 John 4, 8. Whoever does not love, 
does not know God. Why? Because God is love. God is what? God is love. God is love. And people need to see love in action. Let me explain. You see, you can tell somebody that God is love, but they might have grown up in a family where all they knew about or what they thought love was was actually really abuse. Let me explain. I was in New Zealand speaking at a camp meeting some years ago, or not that long ago, really a few years ago, I suppose. And we would present the message. I'd present the message in the evening. We'd have dinner together. We'd sit down and we'd eat. It's my favorite time after the message. You know, we'd talk, we'd socialize, we'd have some fun, connect, connect. What do we do? Connect, that's the key. Connect with people. And we eat together. Well, I noticed something unusual. There was a young man there whose name was Widamu. I think the Māori trans or the, uh, is actually John. That's what his name is, John. And he was there because a family had fostered him. He was about 17 as well, actually. And he actually had one of those ankle braces on. He'd been a bit of a naughty boy. <laughs> they had decided to let him go for this few days because they thought it might be good for him, maybe, get a bit of Christian Christianity. So they allowed the family to take him on this excursion. Well, Widamu was there, and I noticed something. We'd all hang out, we'd wait for our food, then our food would be served. But just as our food arrived, something unusual would happen. Widamu would excuse himself from the table and he'd leave. He'd leave. You know, first night, I suppose, I just thought he was going to the bathroom. Second night, I suppose, I thought he was going to make a phone call. But then it started to plague me, like, what's going on? Where's he going when we're all eating? Why is he leaving? So I waited. Must have been the third night. I waited. I waited. I hid around the corner. We'd all finished eating. Everyone left. I looked around the corner, and there was Widamu. There he was with his plate. There he was. Trying to work out, how do I use a knife and fork? 17 years old. See, Widamu was from a very violent upbringing. Gangs, drugs, all the rest of it. You can tell Woodamoo what love is, but if you don't show Woodamoo what real love is, he doesn't know. That's why God asks us to show people love. Show people in action. Because it speaks louder than words. When I left, I was able to give Woodamoo a Bible and write in it for him and encourage him. I actually gave him my own personal Bible, something I don't like to do, but I did it because I knew it was important for him to have something from me. I didn't want to give that. <laughs> but you got, it's not about you, Amy. It's about others. It's about others. It's about others. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. We have to love people into the kingdom. Show them what love looks like. Treat them in a loving way. Respect them. Show them dignity and honor them. Just do whatever it takes, because <laughs> that's what Jesus is willing to do. Do whatever it takes. Let's read a few verses. In the book of Psalms. Now, my sermon is only 32 minutes long. So if you're timing me, <laughs> no, it was 32 minutes when I timed myself. Maybe slightly longer. All right, Psalm 146, 7 and 9. Say is this. So stay focused. 146, 7 and 3, 9. Who executes justice for the oppressed? Who gives food to the hungry? The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous, and the Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and the widow. But the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. What does God do? He opens the eyes of the blind. You see, that's God's. That is God's. That is God's will, is to open the eyes of the blind that they might see. That they might see. And he wants to liberate those who are in prison. 
so they can be free, amen? How wonderful is it to be free? When the Son sets you free, you shall be what? Free indeed, amen? Free indeed. To wake up knowing who you are, where you're from, where you're going, what your purpose in life is, that is freedom. This world can't give that. Nobody can but God. Nobody can but God, amen? Freedom comes in Jesus and Jesus alone. That's what he's come to do, to make us no longer slaves. You see, the thief comes to seek, kill, and destroy, but God comes to have life and that you might have it more abundantly. See, God wants to give. Satan wants to take. God wants to bless. Satan wants to curse. God wants to heal. Satan wants to destroy. God wants to encourage and build up, and Satan wants to tear down. Anything that you say that is critical or negative, it's not from Jesus, amen. We've got to stop speaking about us. God wants to bless. Deuteronomy 10, 17 through 19. Exodus, Genesis, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, chapter 10, 17 through 19, says the following. For the Lord, your God, our God, he's the God of all gods, the only true God, the great, mighty, and awesome, who does what? Who shows no partiality. He shows what? No partiality, nor takes bribes. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving them food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger. You were once strangers, amen? Love them. Love them. Psalm, oh, sorry, Proverbs. Proverbs. I'm just giving you a few Bible verses because I'm trying to cement my point. Trying to cement my point. Proverbs 31. Almost there. Here we go. Proverbs 31 says the following, 8 and 9. Open your mouth for the speechless. In the cause of all who are appointed to die, that's everyone, open your mouth. Judge righteously and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Plead the cause of the poor and needy. Now, think about that. Some of us like to tend that we're just talking about people that are of a low socioeconomical setting, like poor people, right? I don't believe the Bible is speaking solely of those who don't have wealth, although we all have wealth. However, it means poor. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. There are people that are poor in spirit that need the spirit, Amen. So don't just think that you should be reaching out to those who have less than what you have. No, no, no. We need to reach out to everyone. Remember back there it said God shows no partiality. It doesn't matter if you're poor, middle class, wealthy, extremely wealthy, or Bill Gates. They all need Jesus. They all need Jesus. They all need Jesus. Jeremiah verse, chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9. Remember... I'm still only really building my foundation as to where I'm going in the sermon, by the way, if you're wondering. The year of the pearl. The year of the what? The year of the pearl. And we'll get there before this is done. Verses 23 and verse 24 say the following. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that's God, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. Amen? That's what he delights in. That's what he delights in this morning. You see, we must see people as God sees people. And we must value them as he values them. Not the word that you put on somebody, but the word that he puts on somebody. It's an infinite word, by the way. You see, you will, through the ceaseless ages of eternity, forget about things that have transpired on this planet. But God will not. God will never forget. God will never forget. How do we do this? This is really where things start to take off. And if you came this morning to church to be motivated and encouraged and inspired by the grace of God. I hope that's happening. However, sometimes when we come to church, there's something else that we need. And it starts with the letter C. We need to be challenged. 
we need to be challenged because we get so comfortable when people don't like to tell us or tell us a straight message. They're worried about what people think. But we have to get beyond that. So this is the challenging part of the sermon. <laughs> challenging part of the sermon. But in every challenge, there comes a what at the end of it? A blessing. Think about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They went to the fiery furnace. They came out changed. Well, Daniel didn't, but the others did. Daniel went into the lion's den, amen? I know some of us think, oh, Daniel didn't go out there. Got you. <laughs> Matthew 13. Here we go. Says the following. Says the following. Matthew chapter 13. Verses 44 through to 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has. And he buys that field. Next parable, verse 45, says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. Amen? And he bought it. I want you to think deeply about this this morning as we take off. The treasure... This parable illustrates the value of the heavenly treasure and the effort that should be made to secure it. The finder of the treasure in the field was ready to part with all that he had. How much? All that he had. Think about the disciples. Ready to put forth untiring labor in order to secure the hidden riches. He was willing to do whatever it took, amen. Whatever it took, you want true religion? Show me, show me, show me it by whatever you're doing, amen? Whatever it took. So the finder of heavenly treasure will count no labor too great and no sacrifice too dear. No sacrifice too dear. Remember, you're never sacrificing more than what Christ has already done, amen? No sacrifice too dear in order to gain the treasures of truth. Is that you this morning? I'm going to tell you right now, frankly and honestly, that is not me every day of my life. I wish it was. Oh, I wish it was, but it's not. Lord, have mercy on me because I want it to be. I mean, what about you? Remember, God wants to bless you, and it will come out more clearly. In the parable, the field containing the treasure represents the Holy Scriptures. In other words, each one of us has the opportunity to own a Bible. And that's good that you have a Bible. But having a Bible isn't enough. It's about what's in the Bible and who's in the Bible. You see, the gospel, the what? The gospel, I mean, that's the treasure. What's the treasure? It's the, come on, it's the, you should be excited. It's the, it's the gospel. It's the good news. It's Jesus. It's okay to be fired up about that. It's Jesus. That's the gospel. Have you got Jesus? Amen. Because that's what matters. And people will know if you've got Jesus or not. Oh, no. That's the real treasure. The treasure. Christ himself, talking about the pearl now, is the pearl of great price. In the parable, the pearl is not represented as a gift. Interesting. The merchant man bought it at the price of all that he had. We discussed that. Many question the meaning of this since Christ is represented in the Scriptures as a gift. He is a gift. But only to those who give themselves, soul, body, and spirit to Him without reserve. Without reserve. We are to give ourselves to Christ, to live a life of willing obedience to all His requirements. This is not an easy message. All that we are, all the talents and capabilities we possess are the Lord's, and they are to be consecrated for His service or to His service. Now listen to this. When we thus give ourselves wholly to Him, Christ, who? Christ, with all the treasures of heaven, does what? He gives Himself wholly to us. We obtain the pearl of great price. We obtain the pearl of great price. I don't want to be one of those people who gets to heaven and has regrets, amen? I wish I would. 
It's too late. You either let it all out, you either let go and let God, or you didn't quite make it, amen? That's what it says. There are some who seem to be always seeking for the heavenly pearl. They like associating with people that know the truth, picking up the Bible with Tom Thomas foes, but they do not make an entire surrender. Surrender. Surrender, amen? Surrender of their wrong habits. Oh, I'm just going to drink a little bit. I'm just going to smoke a bit. God loves me. They do not die to self. It's not about what you want. They do not die to self that Christ may live in them. You're not allowing God to make you the best you you can be, amen? Can you imagine being the best you you can be? Oh, I long to see that day for me, amen? Therefore, they do not find the precious pill. They don't find it. They have not overcome unholy ambition and their love for worldly attraction. The world was just, had too much taste. Let's not be in that category of people this morning. They do not take up their cross and follow Christ. It doesn't say, take up your pillow and follow me. Take up your cross. Christ in the path of self-denial and sacrifice. Almost Christians, yet not fully Christian. They seem near the kingdom of heaven, but they cannot enter there. Let's be honest this morning. Think about the parable of the ten virgins. Five wise, five foolish. Read that parable. Study it. They cannot enter there. Almost but not wholly saved means not to be almost but wholly lost. Amen? Don't kid yourself. It's not like, oh, I'll, just, I'll just pass with the seat. I was like that, you know, sometimes. But it's, possible. it's not how it works. Because you've missed out. And others have missed out. And you wouldn't be happy in heaven. You would hate heaven. Because everyone would be so kind and hugging and giving you cuddles. So good to see you, brother. So good to see you, sister. You'd be like, what? Man, I hate this place. Everyone, I just want to get away from all these happy people. You'd hate heaven. So God won't put you somewhere where you would hate to belong, amen? Because you won't belong. That's why he won't take you there. It's out of his grace. Wait, there's more though. This is, the, this is the beautiful point. So give yourself wholly to God. But the parable of the merchant man seeking godly, godly, godly pearls has a double significance. It applies not only to men, you're all right, you and me, as seeking the kingdom of heaven, but to Christ as seeking his lost inheritance. I want to read something to you and I want you to think about it. I want you to think. Psalm 139, 17 and 18 say this. How precious are your thoughts about me, God. How great is the sum of them. If I could count how much you thought about me, they would be more your thoughts than number of the sand on the seashore. You are always with me. Have you ever tried to count a handful of sand? I have. <laughs> and I gave up, amen. <laughs> Takes a long time. God says that his thoughts, his thoughts are more about you than all of the sand on the seashore across this vast world, amen. He thinks about you a lot. He thinks about you a lot. He yearns for you. He desires you. He's desperate for your love. What more can he do, amen? What more can he do? There's nothing more he can do. He's done it all. But what he wants, what he desires, what he needs, what he's looking for is for you to say, yes, Lord, I surrender. Let's have a relationship. Let's commune together. Let's be friends, amen? That's what he wants. Unfortunately, he doesn't often get that, amen? What he gets from me is rejection at times. He, all he wants is to do me good. Do you realize that? All I want to do for my children, and I have two, is to do them good, amen? I want to lavish my love on them. God wants to lavish his love on you. Accept it. Embrace it. 
Hold on, hang on, cling on, and never, ever let go of it. Amen. God wants you. And he is in the business of saving souls. Souls who are willing to be saved. Souls who are willing to be saved. Ever really wondered, as I'm closing here, ever really wondered about what the book of Acts is about? Let's break it down. Every Christian, imagine that everyone in this congregation this morning, every one of us, saw in his brother, those out there, the divine similitude of benevolence and love. One interest prevailed. One subject swallowed up all others. All hearts were beating in harmony. Hallelujah. The only ambition of the believers was to reveal the likeness of Christ's character. That's love. And to labor for the enlargement of his kingdom. The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. And look what happened. With great power, power gave the apostles with great power gave the apostles witnesses of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. And the Lord added to the church daily as such as should be saved. The Spirit of Christ, the Holy Ghost, and that animated, animated the whole congregation. For why? They had found the pearl of great price. It's the year of the pearl, amen. And there are pearls out there everywhere, everywhere. Everywhere. These things are to be repeated. It's coming. Ready or not, he's come. And with greater power, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was the former rain, but the latter rain will be much more abundant. The Spirit awaits, he's waiting. Our demand and reception. Christ is again to be revealed in his fullness by the Holy Spirit's power. Men and women will discern the value of the precious pearl. And with the Apostle Paul, they will say, What things were gained to me, those I count now as loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. Everything I thought that was important in my life, doesn't matter anymore. All that matters is that I reflect the character of God's love to my family, to my friends, to my community. God is moving, amen. And Jesus is coming. He promised he would in the Old Testament. He fulfilled that promise in the New Testament when he arrived. What makes you think that he won't come again? He's coming. He's coming faster than I think we all realize. Don't let it be a surprise to you. He's come. So what is God's will for my life? Start off on the purpose of your life. What's God's plan? It's to reflect his character. Reflect his character. It's to reflect his character. What you're taking with you to heaven. And to seek those precious pearls. Seek those precious pearls. Seek those precious pearls. Finish with this story. I had a friend come to visit me. New Zealand. And they were from the North Island. They wanted to see the South Island. I was living in Christchurch at the time. He said, Carl, when I come to the South Island, can you please take me on a trip around the South Island? Like, it's fine with me. I can do that. It's on a holiday, I think. I really wanted to take them to Nelson, which is where I grew up. I really wanted to go to Nelson. And um, just as we, when they had arrived and we decided to go up there, just as we were about to leave, I felt the strong impression, take a Bible. Oh, it's all good. I've already got my Bible, Lord. I've got a Bible. It's right here. I want you to take another Bible. I felt that impression. Okay, take another one. Got in the car, started to drive, drove throughout that day, stayed that night. The next day, I took my friend up to this place. This is why I'm showing you this photo. It's called The Lookout. It's actually slightly a little bit more around, but it's the one I could find on the net. And um, Nelson's a beautiful town, overlooks this bay, and you can imagine that we were actually there in the winter time, so those mountains with snow cap, amen? Just idyllic, beautiful. But as we were driving into this place called the Lookout, I noticed that there was a car parked on the left-hand side. 
What do you think? Yeah, so what? Well, it was unusual because the view was this way, and the car was parked in this direction. There was no one in the passenger seat, and there was no one in the back seats. There was just the driver sitting in his car on the edge, really, of the view, because it kind of bent around the cliff. I thought, that's just something in me just kind of triggered, and that's weird. I showed my friend, we talked about it, but that impression was there. Carl, you need to speak to that person. I don't want to speak to that person in the car. Carl, you need to speak to that person. Look, it's a really awkward, this is what I'm reasoning with in my mind, eh? I'm rationalizing it out. It's really weird, Lord, because they're on the opposite side of where I'm going to be, and I can't really approach them the other side of the cliff there. Started to make all these excuses why I shouldn't do it, Amen. You ever done that one before? Yeah, I have. Anyway, I just gave in. It just got so strong, I just gave in. I said, all right, God, I feel like you're talking to me. I'm going to go with it. If I make a fall out of myself, I'll make a fall out of myself, whatever. I went up to the car, and I tapped on the window, the passenger window. Guy reached across, wound the window down, and I kind of popped my head in the window. I said, hey, how you going, man? Yep, good. I said, um, you know, just checking out the view here, and um, you know, are there any other places we can kind of check out? He said, no, this is probably the best, the best view in Nelson, I reckon. And I kind of knew that anyway. <laughs> Trying to make some conversation. There's something happening here. Anyway, I said, L- listen, this is just going to sound really weird, but I'm going to put it out there anyway. I said, I noticed you as I drove in. I seen you sitting in your car. And... I'm a Christian. And I just felt this strong desire, and I believe it was from God, just to talk to you and, and just say, I don't know what it is that you're dealing with in your life right now. I don't know what it is that you're challenged with in your life right now or what you're facing in your life right now, but I just want to tell you, as awkward as this is, that there is a God who loves you. A God who loves you. Tears started to well up in his eyes and started to roll down his cheek. And he said, well, I've got something to tell you. I was sitting in this car contemplating suicide and was just getting together the last final thoughts before I went and killed myself. But I said to myself, If there is a God, if God does exist, if God really is real, maybe he could send somebody to tell me that God is real and that he cares. How do you think I felt at that moment, amen? I was like, hallelujah, hallelujah on the inside. I was like, amen, brother. (laughs) And when I did that, I did kind of move briskly back towards my car because I'd put on the extra Bible, remember? I said, God had this plan. I had that Bible and I grabbed it. I said, you wouldn't believe this. And I told him the story, man, you wouldn't believe this. But this, yesterday I left and I found a priest taking another Bible with me and I believe it's for you. It's for you, brother. And I wrote in it and encouraged him and, and you know, we hugged and, I, and he cried a little bit and I, and I prayed for him, amen. And hallelujah, I don't know what happened from that day forth in his life. However, I do know that he had a divine encounter with Jesus Christ. Pearls, my friend. It's all about pearls. You see, when you find the pearl, you can't help yourself but not want to speak about the pearl, amen? You can't help but not want to tell Jesus, people about Jesus and the gospel, the good news, the liberation, the joy, the satisfaction, the peace. Oh my goodness, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. And you know what? It's yours. It's all yours. It's free. It's available. And you can have it. All you have to do is accept it, amen? Blair's going to come forward and sing for us. Jesus has paid it all. He's paid it all. Why won't you take him up on his offer? Why? I'm telling you. I'm trying to encourage you. I've done the best that I physically can do today. And it's not about me. Accept Jesus, for you'll never be the same. You'll never be the same again. Never, ever, ever be the same again.
Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper spots And melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to say, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. The sin had left a crimson stain, he was it white as snow, and Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. The sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow, he washed did white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Amen. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. I want to make an appeal. This is the year of the pearl. This is our time to shine, amen. This is our time to shine. God has a people. And they will finish the work. Will you be in that number or in that category of people who finish the work? I want to be, amen. If you want to be, I'm asking you to stand to your feet. This isn't some flippant appeal. I'm serious. If you want to be one of those individuals who finishes the work for Jesus, I'm asking and I'm calling you to stand to your feet on behalf of Jesus Christ. That we would be united together as his people, as his children, you're not going to walk out of here the same person today. God is going to hold you now responsible and accountable to the decision that you're making. So if life gets tough, don't give up, amen. You just got to keep on battling on, amen. You just got to keep on keeping on. You see, our God, he's a way maker and he is a habit breaker. He is the hope of the human race and he is a God of grace. He is my song in the night, and he is the light, amen. The way, the truth, and the life. That's who he is. That's who he is. And he's yours, free of charge. Free of charge. And when the sun sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we feel you moving on us today, Lord. I want to stop teeter-tottering in my walk with you, Lord. I want to stop being a hypocrite. I want to be, Lord, a man of God and walk with you. And walk with you, Lord. I want to be used by you to finish the work. To usher in the second coming. Because it's just around the corner. 
like Dr. Nick has already said today, there may not be a 2019. There may not. And there won't be for some people probably in this room. However, the only thing that matters is that we've accepted you. So when it does all unravel, and when it's all said and done, we'll be with you for the ceases, ages of eternity. Lord, just bless us the Sabbath now as we head forth. Help us to remember what we've heard, to find the pearl ourselves personally, and then to look for pearls. Help us to be open to the Spirit moving on us to ask us maybe to do unusual things, like stop and listen. We ask this Jesus Christ in your most excellent name that everyone say. Amen.